Hello, everybody, and welcome to Nursing 3370, Module 2, Lesson 6, Alterations in the Pulmonary System. In this lesson, we will briefly overview the physiology of the pulmonary system. Then we'll spend some time looking at a variety of different pulmonary disorders, including pneumonia, cystic fibrosis, asthma, and COPD. We will then discuss the appropriate pharmacology used to treat the different pulmonology disorders. To start our review of physiology, we will first talk about ventilation. Ventilation is the process of inspiration and expiration. Airflow depends on a pressure gradient, which is known as Boyle's Law. Air always moves from high pressure areas to low pressure areas. So when we breathe, it's important to remember we are breathing using negative pressure. Our diaphragm drops down and that creates a vacuum in our thoracic cavity and that pulls the air in from the higher pressure area to the lower pressure area. Atmospheric pressure is higher than the pressure in the alveoli so with inspiration, air moves from the atmosphere into the lungs, which is now makes the pressure in the alveolar higher than in the atmosphere. And then the opposite happens with expiration. Air moves from the lungs into the atmosphere. So again, remember the alveoli, um, remember back from anatomy and physiology, there are those little sacs at the very bottom of our lungs. That's where gas exchange actually happens. And so typically the atmospheric pressure to start with is higher than the pressure in those little alveoli. So when we breathe in, that air moves from the high pressure to the low pressure. And then once those alveoli fill up with air, they now become higher pressure than the atmosphere. And then the reverse happens and that's where the expiration comes in. Oops. Sorry, I'm using a split screen here and uh, my mouse has got to be on the right spot or it accidentally moves forward. So this slide here is a demonstration of the mechanism of pulmonary ventilation. You can pause here to review this process of breathing. Uh, some of this might be reviewed from your a &P, of course, and uh, really it's just important to understand how the pressure gradients work. Um, again, with that um, inhalation and then exhalation, uh, really those are kind of important to grasp. So pause here and just kind of review this. And it's sort of what we kind of already covered with higher to lower areas of gradient. The primary control of ventilation is, lo is located in the medulla and the pons, which is why the brainstem is so very important. Brainstem injuries can stop breathing. And so depending on what level that brainstem injury happens, it's really important to know because that's when a respiratory drive becomes an issue if that brainstem injury is right at that spot. Ventilation is, is also controlled by chemoreceptors that detect changes in carbon dioxide levels, hydrogen ions, which is that acid we already talked about, and oxygen levels in the blood or the cerebral spinal fluid. Our chemical receptors, our, ke our central chemical receptors are located let me say that again. Our central chemoreceptors are located in the medulla, and we also have some peripheral chemoreceptors located in the carotid bodies in the area that the baroceptors are also located. So normal control of ventilation is based off of a hypercapnipia drive. Hypercapnipia is ox is high carbon dioxide levels. So hypercapnipia is too much carbon dioxide. The chemoreceptors recognize there's too much carbon dioxide in the body, which stimulates the central chemoreceptors in the medulla, which then stimulates the respiratory muscles. We are trig triggered to take a deep breath in or breathe faster, which will decrease that carbon dioxide. When we decrease the carbon dioxide, we have decreased stimulation. We are then triggered to slow our breaths, which will then cause a retention again of that carbon dioxide, which increases in the blood and, and in cerebral spinal fluid. And then this starts that cycle all over again. So our normal ventilation is triggered really by an excess of carbon dioxide. And this really becomes important when we start talking about uh, COPD. Uh, so pause here and just kind of review what the stimulus is for that regular control of ventilation, which again is our carbon dioxide levels. So on this slide, again, the primary drive for ventilation is what we just reviewed on the previous screen. The drive to breathe is controlled by hypercapnipnia or carbon dioxide levels. 
we do have a secondary drive for breathing, which is called the hypoxic drive. This happens if something fails in our hypercapnicnic drive, and we are now responding to a low, or we're not responding to a low carbon dioxide level. We will also respond secondarily to an oxygen level that is too low. This is really an important control mechanism for people with COPD, which we're going to learn about later in this lecture, who've lost that hypercapnipnia drive. And again, we're going to review that in just a little bit. But remember, the primary drive for the body to breathe is that high carbon dioxide level. We're driven to blow that off. And that happens with each and every breath. When that drive is not there, then the body switches and it's the low oxygen levels that then drive us to breathe. Gas exchange happens in the alveoli, and it is that flow of gases between the alveoli air and the blood. Ventilation is air going in and out. It's just tip your air in and your air out. Respiration is where the gas exchange occurs. Gas exchange depends on the relative concentration of gases. So again, pressure areas move from high to low, and these gases will adjust and move according to the gradient of high and low. So this photo here is a brief review of the anatomy of the alveoli. We can say the alveoli, which are right here, these little sacs, they have a mesh of kind of capillaries surrounding them. These capillaries are like one or two levels of capillary thick cell levels. So it allows for e easy diffusion of the gases across these barriers because of how thin they are. Uh, the pressure gradient then takes effect. This is important when we talk about pathophysiological conditions because any disruption in the thickness of these cell layers or in the blood flow here will actually affect our respiration. And remember again, respiration being that gas exchange. Factors that affect the diffusion of gas include partial pressure gradient, the thickness of the respiratory membrane, fluid accumulation in the alveoli, or interstitial tissue that damages that gas exchange, and also the total surface area available for diffusion. If we have damage to the alveolar tissue, tissue, it may not be able to diffuse gases because there's not enough surface area for that gas exchange to happen. The alveolar really need to be like the perfect shape and size for that gas exchange to happen. And then finally, there is ventilation perfusion ratio, which is ventilation versus blood flow. You do need to have blood flow flowing to these alveoli so you can have gas exchange. If you have plenty of fluid, but not enough oxygen, you will still not have good gas exchange. And then if you have plenty of air, but not enough blood, you have a mismatch and again, not enough gas exchange. So it's really important to have the appropriate ventilation and perfusion ratio to have that appropriate gas exchange. So after just that real brief refresh on pulmonary anatomy and physiology, we will move on to a variety of different pulmonary conditions and we'll refresh anatomy and physiology as we go if it pertains to uh, the specific condition we're learning about. So you've all likely heard of pneumonia before, you've either had it, you know someone who has, or you've just heard it, it seems like a pretty common respiratory condition. Uh, pneumonia is a condition where the parenchyma of the lungs becomes inflamed. Pulmonary parenchyma is a term that refers to the parts of the lungs that are involved in gas transfer. This can include the alveoli, the interstitium, the blood vessels, the bronchi, and the bronchioles. Pneumonia can be due to bacterial, fungal, or viral infections. Pneumonia can lead to pathophysiological changes in the interstitial tissue, the alveolar septi, an alveoli can then sometimes even lead to permanent changes. Pneumonia can impair oxygen diffusion and it can lead to severe hypoxia. So this photo here helps to demonstrate a little bit of the location of the pneumonia. You can see that alveoli with the small uh, thin membrane on that left-hand side, you can see that normal bronchioli and that normal alveoli. You can see there's just that real thin membrane there and this is where the gas exchange again happens. And then with pneumonia on the right hand side, there is infection there and with infection kind of comes pus and fluid and definitely inflammation. And when all that happens around that membrane, it thickens it and makes it harder for the gas exchange to happen. So it's like 
you can imagine that gas exchange on the right hand side is impaired because um, while it doesn't look like they're all that thicker, there's definitely fluid there, which impairs that shape of that alveoli. Pneumonia is classified based on the causative agent. Again, it can either be a viral, a bacterial, or a fungal infection. It's important to remember that infection is what causes the pneumonia. The pneumonia is secondary to that infection. So with a strong immune system, most infections won't progress to pneumonia. So somebody might have a respiratory infection or might have a viral illness um, like influenza or might have a bacterial in illness or a fungal infection, but they have good immune systems and so it doesn't progress to pneumonia. So you don't catch pneumonia really, you catch a viral bacterial or fungal infection and then it progresses to that pneumonia. The infection can be various spots within the lungs themselves. It can be on one side, it can be on both sides, or it can be consolidated into one specific lobe. Pneumonia is also classified by epidemiology data. It can be no nosocomial, which means the person obtained the pneumonia while they're in the hospital. This could be because maybe they were on a ventilator or maybe there was poor hand hygiene from the staff or lack of mobility due to whatever brought them in the hospital in the first place, like they had a broken bone and then they were laying in bed for a very long time with little mobility and poor hygiene and all those sorts of things can lead to an infection. Nosocomial means again that it was caught while in the hospital. Pneumonia can also be a community acquired, which means just that they obtain it in the community. Most often this is like in a nursing home setting or other tight quarter living situation in which someone gets an infection and it starts to spread around. And then finally, no, pneumonia can also be caused by aspiration, which is when we inhale food or fluid into that sterile space in the lung where it doesn't belong. Um, the lungs recognizes that a foreign body and it can progress to a pneumonia. This is common again in the elderly population or people who have swallowing, um, ish, swallowing issues along with poor immunity. So again, there are different types of pneumonia. This slide here is getting really specific, but on quick review, bronchopneumonia. Now, if you need a refresh on that anatomy, go look at what the bronchospace is in your, in your lungs. Bronchopneumonia is scattered small patches that follow the bronchi, whereas lobular pneumonia is consolidated and specific to one lobe. Uh, the cause for lobular pneumonia is often streptococcus pneumoniae, and bronchopneumonia is a variety of different bacteria. It's important to know which one, because when we start selecting antibiotics, it's important to know what antibiotic is receptive, especially if we know it's streptococcus pneumonia, we would select an antibiotic appropriate to, to fight off that bacteria. The pathophysiology um, with lobular pneumonia, you can pause and read the difference there. You won't be tested on it, but just know a little bit of what the difference is. The onset of lobular pneumonia is sudden and acute. They get pr sick, pretty sick pretty fast. And then bronchopneumonia is kind of insidious. It kind of is slower going and takes a little bit longer to, to progress. Signs, we're gonna go over them in detail on the next few slides here, and you'll see that they are pretty similar as, as we get through them. So again, if you look on the left side on this screen, it shows a bronchopneumonia. If you look on the right, it shows a lobular pneumonia. You can see where that number two is. I do have a better um, actual x-ray picture in a few slides here that I think kind of drives home a little bit more what the difference in the lobular and the bronchopneumonia looks like. Uh, but you can see the bronco is diffuse. It's kind of all over a variety of different um you can see those green um, alveoli. I think that's representing those ones that are infected. Whereas on the right-hand side where it's the lobular pneumonia, it's just that one side, that one specific um, lobe that's involved here. So again, lobular pneumonia, lobar pneumonia is usually a bacterial pneumonia that is community-based. It can even happen in young adults, though it is more common in the elderly. Again, it's usually caused by the streptococcus pneumonia. The infection is localized in one or more lobes, but it can also spread to the pleural cavity, which is then called empyema. It's kind of a fun word to say, empyema. Lobular, lobar pneumonia um, is a bacterial pneumonia usually with a sudden onset with symptoms that include high fever, 
with chills, fatigue, and leukocytosis. Leukocytosis is elevated white count. So on blood work, you'll see their white count be elevated. These patients often look very sick. You'll see they have dyspnea, which is difficulty breathing. They'll have tachypnea, which is fast paced breathing. And they'll have tachycardia, which is fast heart rate. This patient also might report some pleural pain, which is pain to like the lung area. On assessment, you will hear rails in the lungs, which will make more sense once you start learning about nursing assessment techniques, but you can kind of hear what pneumonia sounds like. The patient will have a productive cough, often with rusty colored sputum. And finally, the patient, especially in the elderly, might have some confusion and disorientation, and likely that's from um, hypoxia, like the lack of oxygen, the lack of gas exchange happening, or it's progressed to the point where they're sepsis and septic. Bronchopneumonia, on the other hand, is more diffuse pattern of an infection in both lungs. Sometimes we've heard this called walking pneumonia. It can be categorized by several different species of microorganisms. A bunch of different bacteria can cause this one. It causes infl inflammatory exudate um, that form in the alveoli. Again, onset tends to be insidious, slow going, moderate fever, cough, rails. You can get a productive cough with purulent sputum. Sometimes this is that yellow green stuff that people cough up. It's a slower onset, but patients tend to be uh, and tend to be less ill. But left untreated, it can really progress, and that's why it's important to identify it early. Even though it's slow and insidious, you don't want it to go to the point where it's it's untreated, and then we have um, bigger problems. So this is the slide that I was talking about, just for fun. This is an X-ray that shows pneumonia. The photo on the left, um, the photo on the left here, this left lung. Um, I'm thinking my, I'm hoping my uh, mouse is showing up here, but this left lung, you kind of have, um, first I'm going to back up and say as a registered nurse, it is not within your scope of practice to read and interpret um, x-rays. You will look at a lot of x-rays over the course of your career, but it's not your scope of practice to actually read or analyze them. But on quick glance, it's kind of fun to look, see here and show you what it looks like. This left picture, this left lung here, which actually would be the right lung, right? Because this is looking directly at the patient. But on this left side screen here, um, you see there's a nice firm kind of angle here. There's this, this angle is kind of what we're looking for. And then if you look over on this side, you don't really see it. You kind of see it's kind of washed out with this white, kind of washed out kind of look. There's not defined um, margins or borders. You can't really kind of find all of, well, you can see the ribs a little bit, but um, it just kind of looks that washed out look. So this would be that low, low burn pneumonia we were talking about versus the other side, you can see the scattered patchy, patches of white, this kind of scattered all over. This would be the bronchopneumonia, which really kind of happens all over the lungs. And I think that gives you the picture of um, what the difference is between the two. At the end of the day, you're gonna treat a pneumonia patient pretty similarly, except you might give them a different antibiotic. Um, but it's important to recognize that the um, bronchopneumonia, because it's slow going, they might not be immediately sick. And so uh, it's important for you to, um, you know, pay attention and, and assess patients accordingly. So pharmacology pneumonia treatment is based on cause. Again, if it's um, a bacterial infection, we're going to use an antibiotic. If it's a viral infection, we may give an antiviral, not in all cases, but we may be using an antiviral. And then if it's a fungal infection, we'll be given drugs for fungal causes of pneumonia. Uh, we're not going to get too into fungal pneumonias, but those patients are often really sick because the fungal stuff that's kind of growing in their lungs, it's wet, it's warm in there. It's a great place for fungus to want to grow and reproduce. Um, these patients can be difficult to treat. Uh, so again, important knowing what the cause is, if it's uh, bacterial, viral pneumonia, or fungal. And sometimes we actually have to um, send off a sample of the sputum, which will, which will help test what, um, what is in that sputum. Most causes of bacterial pneumonia can be treated at home with oral antibiotics. We aren't admitting patients to the hospital as much as we used to. They tend to be really sick with pneumonia by the time they get admitted. Most often, again, we can treat them at home with oral antibiotics, but severe cases may require IV, uh, which does provide more immediate and faster treatment for the very sick patient. One of our biggest priorities in getting antibiotics started is getting them started right away. So this patient, uh, you don't want to wait days. You don't want to wait until um, 
So let's just say we do collect that sputum sample and we send it off to the lab and it's a day or two. You don't wait for that to come back. You get this patient started on an antibiotic right away. You can always change courses after the fact, but your biggest priority um, is always getting those antibiotics started. And of course, if you're here to become a nurse, you can't select the antibiotic and you're not going to be ordering them, but you'll know it's your priority to be looking out for getting those antibiotics and getting them hung right away. Some people will need some respiratory support with oxygen. Um, and then the key, the photo on the right here just kind of pulls it all together. It, re it reviews that pneumonia is really the obstruction um, that impacts gas exchange. Your symptoms you can see here, you're going to have those productive coughs. Um, and ultimately, we need to get these patients on, on antibiotics or they aren't going to get better. Well, they will, but it will it would not, it will be slow going and take a very long time. Changing gears now to cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is actually a genetic disorder. It's an inherited disorder that people are born with. It causes tenacious mucus from exocrine glands. And if you can't remember back from anatomy and physiology, you can pause and go look up what the exocrine glands are. The primary effects of cystic fibrosis are seen in both the lungs and the pancreas. The effects on the lung is thick mucus that obstructs airflow in the bronchioles and the small bronchi. It can cause what's called atelectasis. And to kind of visualize what atelectasis is, um, it's really a flat and sticky alveoli. Uh, but to picture that in your head, picture a person who is hyperventilating. You've probably seen this on a TV or movie before they're hyperventilating. And we give them that brown paper lunch sack to breathe in and they slow their breathing in and out. They're breathing in the bag and out the bag. Well, when they take that breath in, that paper bag collapses and crushes down. There's no pressure inside that bag. A normal healthy alveoli should have a little bit of air pressure and always stay just a tad bit open. But in atelectasis, there, atelectasis, there is alveolar deflation. So as the person takes that deep breath, they collapse that alveoli all the way down, kind of like that brown paper bag did. And then the alveoli, because there's infection in there, they're sticky with fluid. Um, it can leave, it can have a loss of pressure um, and then they just kind of stick. The alveoli aren't able to open up. And this is what's known as atelectasis. So because the cystic fibrosis patient has thick mucus in their lungs, it can lead to this atelectasis. Uh, when atelectasis happens, the alveoli can't inflate properly, which means blood tissues and organs may not get the oxygen it needs. Cystic fibrosis can cause permanent damage to the bronchial walls. Infection among cystic fibrosis patients are more common because if they always have mucus on their lungs, it's a common place for bacteria to, to grow. And so these patients often have um, frequent infections. So here's an image that shows a normal airway. Um, up on top there, you can see a nice normal airway. Those tubes are clear and open. And then the airway that's highlighted there in the circle down below is compromised by cystic fibrosis. You can see the cystic fibrosis lung. There's a great deal of sticky, thick mucus. And as you can imagine, that can easily block the airway. The sticky fluid can also affect um, the pancreas over here, which you can see in the picture. Um, but we're going to talk about more of that when we get to the endocrine unit and we start talking about um, diabetes and we'll talk about um, cystic fibrosis again. So right now, because we're in the respiratory unit, we're obviously talking about how cystic fibrosis affects the lung. So in addition, I mean, briefly, we'll back up here a little bit and say because there is biliary blockage in the pancreas, cystic fibrosis can cause issues in the digestive tract, including blockage of those pancreas ducts obstruction of the bile ducts, and also the salivary glands can be mildly affected. The reproductive tract can also be affected, which includes obstruction of the vas deferens in males and obstruction of the cervix in females. The one thing that is common with cystic fibrosis is that people have a very high sweat, um, or high sodium chloride level. Um, so their sweat is very high in sodium. We're going to review that here in just a minute with the signs and symptoms. Again, primarily focusing on the respiratory, but important to know it affects um, a variety of other areas because of that thick fl fluid. And this is a very complex photo. When, whenever we have these super complex photos, this is just a, a moment to pause, kind of take it all in. You won't be, at, you won't be asked in e extensive detail to memorize this graph for a test, but um, 
if you looked up, it's an auto recessive disorder and you went and looked up where those endocrine glands are, um, endocrine gland dysfunction is a common thing with cystic fibrosis because of this excessive thick sticky mucus that extracts the ducts of all the extracrine glands. And you can see here the lungs, the digestive tract, the reproductive tract, and the sweat glands are affected. And so um, we'll keep going on here and learn a little bit more about the signs and symptoms. So the signs and symptoms of cystic fibrosis, thinking back to that slide you just saw, all the areas, digestive is one of them. Um, so the meconium bowel, that thick uh, meconium that babies have at birth, there might be a meconium bowel obstruction. You might not see any stool coming out. You may notice that at birth. But quite honestly, one of the first things we see or the first thing that a parent will tell us is about the salty skin. And go back to that slide and look at the sweat glands that are affected. Sometimes a mom will say something, a mom or dad will say something like, it's salty when I kiss my baby. My baby just tastes salty or they'll notice like salt rings on their face or something. Um, this might then lead to the provider to perform a sweat test, which can then lead to the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. These babies might also be seeing signs of malabsorption, steatorrhea, and abdominal distension. Primarily, what we also notice is a chronic cough and frequent respiratory infections that tend to increase over time. Oftentimes, you'll see a baby who's failed to meet normal growth milestones, not necessarily meant the developmental delays, but rather those physical developmental milestones are not met. So this photo pulls together cystic fibrosis. You can review the signs and symptoms again by pausing if you need to. Uh, the treatment, of, again, is going to inclu include increased calorie intake, especially protein to help weight gain. Pulmonary therapy is common. So if you see under here of the treatment where it says increased diet protein, then underneath it, you're going to see something called pulmonary therapy. There's something called chest physiotherapy and postural drainage. Um, this is where um, you, you might have um, like tapping on the back or... Um, the use of devices with tapping on the back, which gets this fluid to move around. So sometimes they might have that chest physiotherapy. Uh, they might have breathing exercises. They might be on medications. Um, they're going to be on a lot of different medications, which we aren't going to spend a lot of time going in. Um, but these patients are sick. They have this for their whole life. Um, they actually have um, a low life expectancy because this, you, you can treat the symptoms, but you can't treat this disease. Um, and interestingly enough, um, our neighbor who was our caregiver for our children, I had twin, I have twins, uh, they're 19 now, but when they were in kindergarten and first grade, our neighbor lady um, who was well into her 40s with cystic fibrosis was watching our kids um, after school. We could watch her progress from getting them off the bus to not being able to walk down the end of the block to only being able to sit in her front porch when they came home. Um, actually had a double lung transplant down. I believe it was with Mayo. She got a notice that lungs were ready for her and she is now, well, they're 19 and they, that was like kindergarten. And so she's she's thriving with her new sets of lungs. It's just amazing um, to see what we can do uh, with transplants like that. So moving on to asthma. Asthma is a condition you've all likely heard of. Asthma is defined as bronchial obstruction and is due to having a hypersensitivity to something or a hyper-responsive airway. It can incur in childhood or it can have an adult onset. It often occurs with a family history of allergic conditions. It's a pathophysiological change of the bronchi and the bronchioles that causes inflammation of the mucosa with edema. It leads to bronchial constriction caused by contractions of the smooth muscle, and it includes secretions of thick mucus, and these changes create obstructive airways, either partial or total. So I think you can likely picture um, someone you've seen that's struggling to breathe, that they may or may not have um, asthma, and the um, symptoms that we'll get into here in just a minute will help explain it even more. This photo, though, is a good representation of the inflammation I was talking about. Uh, and again, in a moment, we'll learn what causes this. So you can see a normal airway, nice and open. The air can easily move in and out. You can see someone that has inflammation. Now that that bronchiole is, is swollen and inflammation causes less space, breathing can be difficult when the airways get red, swollen with inflammation. And then airway constriction with a person who has an asthma um, the airways are going to constrict even more, and you can see 
how that airway gets tighter and tighter. It's harder to breathe with muscle spasms and tightening your airways. Uh, when I'm in the clinic talking with patients, especially the teenage kids that I can't get to take their inhalers regularly, because, you know, when you're a teenager on the basketball team, it's not cool to take your inhalers. And so I talk to them a lot about how asthma works. And that like a person who doesn't have asthma would be drinking or well, breathing, not drinking, but breathing through a normal size straw. So the normal lung on the far left here would like represent a normal size straw. So when you're breathing in, you're breathing out, air goes in and out, but then compare it to if you are breathing through like a, so with the kids, I use a juice box straw with the adults. I use a cocktail straw, same thing. But what I try to get them to picture is like when you're going to go drink your favorite drink, um, let's just use water because we're talking kids here, and you guzzle that water through a regular straw, you're going to get fluid in and out pretty easily, right? When you guzzle that same water through a cocktail or a juice box straw, not going to get as much fluid. And that's the analogy I like to use with breathing. So when you don't have asthma, you're breathing through like a regular straw. And then when you're all flared up with an asthma attack, you're breathing through a juice box straw. And when we get to the medications, which are your inhalers, they're your bronchodilators and they get that lung to go from a juice box straw back to a regular straw. And that's why I try to get the teenage kids to say, teenage young adults to say, listen, you really need to take your inhaler before your game because you don't want to breathe through a, a juice box straw. You want to breathe through a regular straw. Um, and obviously they're not literally drinking through a straw, but that's the analogy that I like to give. And it seems to help just a little bit um, for them to kind of picture what their lungs are looking like. So the most common asthma by far is known as extrinsic asthma. Extrinsic asthma occurs when the immune system overreacts to a harmless substance such as pollen or dust. Extrinsic, extrinsic asthma is caused by an allergic reaction to something in the environment that the immune system views as foreign to your body. Acute episodes are triggered by hypersensitivity reaction in which mast cells that line the bronchial mucus membranes release histamine or other chemical mediators. So you are exposed to pollen, this um, mast cell happens, the histamine ha release happens, and that causes the um, bronchos to constrict. And so you can't get that air in and out. And so external asthma is by far the most common. Intrinsic asthma is less common and it tends to occur more in adulthood. This is when tissue in the airway becomes hyper responsive to respiratory infections. So it kind of like overreacts. It can also be caused by stress or exposure to cold. So you might get that your, your airways like super responding to stress or super responding to cold. You can get that sort of asthma-like situation. It can be from inhaled of irritants, exercise, drugs, or medications. Um, when we think about intrinsic, we'll think about this is coming from the inside. It is more internal versus that external um, extrinsic, extrinsic asthma. I guess I can't say that word very well. So signs and symptoms of asthma include coughed, marked dyspnea, and again, dyspnea is shortness of breath. They might get a feeling of tightness in their chest. You might notice wheezing, which is a whistle type sound of a respiratory, the respiratory sound sounds like a whistle. I'm thinking maybe some of you have heard a wheeze, but think about it, it sounds like a whistle, which makes sense because if their airway is constricted, now you're putting air through a oddly shaped constricted tube, it's going to make that whistle sound. They might have rapid and labored breathing. They're trying really hard to compensate because they can't take a deep breath. So they're going to breathe faster and harder. Asthma might have thick or sticky mucus. A tachycardia might happen because the heart is trying to pump more oxygenated blood. And hypoxia might also happen, which is usually a late sign. Again, you can see here your symptoms and your causes and triggers that might trigger um, an asthma attack. More signs or conditions that happen with asthma in the early stages or very beginning, you tend to see these patients with respiratory alkalosis, see how important our acid base is. If you think back to that acid base, this patient is usually going to start hyperventilating so, and they blow off a lot of that carbon dioxide in an attempt to get more oxygen into their system. After a while though, they'll usually start to become quite acidotic because they can't expel that carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide levels rise and it starts to enter their bloodstream. This is usually a very late sign that happens during a very severe asthma attack. 
You can get severe respiratory distress that leads to hypoxemia and respiratory acidosis. Respiratory distress is someone who's actually, I mean, they're struggling to breathe, but they're maintaining fairly normal vital signs and normal mentation, whereas respiratory failure is when they're no longer to able to do that anymore. They have mar marked hypoxia, cyanosis, and decreased mentation because they're no longer able to get enough oxygenation to support these functions. Most asthma attacks are regulated and can be treated with medications, which we'll go over, but there is a form of asthma that is more severe, and it's known as status asthmaticus. This is a persistent, severe attack of asthma that does not respond to the usual therapy. This is absolutely a medical emergency. If you are out of the hospital, this is a 911 medical emergency. If you are in the hospital, this is pushing your buttons, your code buttons, and getting all the help in the room. This can be fatal. Uh, these patients can develop respiratory failure. Uh, these patients often need to be intubated so the machine is breathing for them and they can be sick for an extended period of time. Okay, so moving on from asthma to COPD. I know I've used the COPD acronym quite a bit now and I'm gonna spell it out for you. This one tends to get a little bit more complicated than asthma. COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is a group of lung diseases that block flow and make it difficult to breathe. Emphysema and chronic bronchitis are the two most common conditions that make up COPD, but it can also involve bronchiectasis, which is a secondary condition. It's more like chronic asthma, infection and inflammation of the air uh, of the airways, which it's in italics because we're not going to entirely focus on this in this lecture at all. We're going to focus primarily on emphysema and chronic bronchitis that make up that COPD. So again, COPD is a group of chronic respiratory disorders that causes irreversible and progressive damage to the lungs. So it's really important that this is to the point where this is irreversible and causing damage to the lungs. You can damage your lungs across the lifespan, but when it progresses to COPD, that damage is irreversible. When they progress to COPD, it can be a debilitating condition that may affect an individual's ability to work or perform their activities of daily life. Um, ADLs is the abbreviation, which means brushing your teeth, combing your hair, making your meals, all the stuff you do every day, it can become difficult. COPD can lead to pulmonary hypertension. It can lead to a specific condition called core pulmonal, which is when you have heart failure on the right side. We're going to discuss that way more in detail in the cardiac unit. And COPD can also lead to respiratory failure over time. We're going to start here. This table shows the comparison between emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Uh, we're going to get into detail in each of them on the next few slides. But you can see uh, the key things is the, that they're both usually caused by smoking. It's this is these lifetime smokers that that lead to COPD. The emphysema is located in the alveoli, whereas the chronic bronchitis is in the bronchi. Uh, the symptoms are going to be just the um, same but different. They're going to have that cough, marked dyspnea, and I'll wait to go into the specific conditions until we get um, on the slides. But once we review emphysema and bronchitis, come back to the slide for your side-by-side -side comparison if that helps you um, picture them a little better. So emphysema, we'll focus on that first. That again is the destruction of the alveolar walls and the septi, which leads to large, permanently inflated alveolar air spaces. When we talk about atelectasis, in which these air spaces are collapsed and closed, emphysema is the opposite. These air spaces are actually hyperinflated and they can't get rid of the air. That air just sits in there and all of that space becomes unusable gas exchange. COPD contributing factors include genetic deficiencies, genetic tendencies, and again, by far the most impacting COPD would be cigarette smoking. You can see the picture on the right here with the emphysema. Um, you can see where the air exchange happens in the alveoli, but with the um, emphysema, the air becomes trapped in there and it just can't get out um, because of the damage specifically to the alveoli. So that breakdown of the alveolar wall results in loss of surface area for gas exchange. We can have a loss of pulmonary capillaries because if we stretch them too far, picture that last one where everything was stretched too far, it can lead to fibrosis 
which is narrowed airways and narrowed walls, and it can make it really difficult for expiration to happen. You will often see patients with emphysema have prolonged expirations in which they're trying to breathe air out longer than normal. Sometimes they'll breathe slower with pursed lips uh, because it's difficult for them to get that air out. That air is, is kind of trapped in there. And so they take a breath in and then they breathe out with their pursed lips. So their lips are pressed together. And they have that long expiratory phase. It's almost like they're blowing out through a straw. Um, which helps increase the pressure, right? So if we just breathe out with our mouth open, that pressure is low. If you purse your lips together, the pressure will increase kind of like a big hose versus a small hose. And so increasing that pressure is trying to help push that air that's trapped out of there, uh, push that trapped air out. So oftentimes, um, you know, a very trained medical person can pretty much hear emphysema. You can see the way they're breathing with that purse lip uh, breath. Eventually, they will have progressive difficulty with expiration that is due to that air trapping and increased residual volume, as well as overflation of the lungs. You will start to see some physiological changes in the patients, with one of them specifically being a barrel chest. Because if we have lungs that are chronically inflated, it will start to push outwards on the ribs and it will stretch the muscles of the ribs, the intercostal muscles. The chest will be remodeled or changed to a barrel chest to accommodate the extra air. You will also start to see a flattening of the diaphragm on x-rays because the lungs will not allow the diaphragm to entirely relax. So you can see the picture here, the normal chest um, on the one side and on the other side, you can see that barrel chest where the um, anterior posterior ratio, it's as wide as it is front to back as it is side to side. You can see on the, on the normal chest, front to back should not be as wide. It's about a two to one ratio in the normal chest, but as the barrel chest, um, it really becomes as wide as it is um, front to back, side to side. And that's pretty common presentation with emphysema that's progressed over the years. When emphysema becomes even more advanced, you will start to see the physiological changes, but you will also start to see hypercapnipnia develop. If we don't have good gas exchange, we can't get rid of that carbon dioxide um, in our blood levels and the carbon dioxide will start to rise. They will start to rise pretty consistently with, with poor gas exchange in emphysema patients. So our normal respiratory drive is triggered by too much carbon dioxide, which we've been talking about, or that hypercapnipnia drive. My CO2 goes up, hypercapnipnia kicks in, and I start to breathe. But with emphysema, if our carbon dioxide is chronically elevated, as with this emphysema, our body starts to recognize that it can't use carbon dioxide as the marker for when it needs to breathe more. So what the body starts to do is it starts to ignore that high carbon dioxide and starts to trigger its breathing based off of low oxygenation, which is that secondary drive to breathe or that hypoxic drive. Normal oxygen saturation in a healthy patient would be about 95% or above, but a COT, COPD patient might have a totally tolerable O2 saturation level of 88% because it takes that oxygenation or that oxygen dipping down that low before we trigger them to breathe. When struggling to breathe due to respiratory distress, we will apply oxygen in these patients. So, you know, a patient comes in and they're in distress, we will apply oxygenation or oxygen. But over time in a patient with emphysema and COPD, we might need to use oxygen carefully, or we could actually diminish those patients drive to breathe. Because remember, the low oxygen in this patient is actually what's driving them to breathe. So we need to use very careful um, oxygenation in these patients. Um, emphysema patients finally are also prone to infections because they aren't adequately able to exhale. Here's an example of that hypoxic drive, which is a little different than that high capnipnia drive. You can see you can see it's sort of the opposite effect. Um, you aren't you don't have to memorize this word for word, but just know that when the um, carbon dioxide levels are chronically high and that body can no longer use that as its trigger to breathe, it will switch and that hypoxic drive is how um, the body will be triggered to breathe. Signs and symptoms of emphysema include dyspnea, which again is that difficulty breathing. 
It often starts with dyspnea up upon exertion. So it's hard for them to walk without getting shortness of breath, but this can also progress to dyspnea all the time, not just with activity. We will see hyperventilation with that prolonged expiratory phase like we talked about because it's hard for them to get that breath due to the lack of the alveolar tissue. They're trying really hard at this point to push the air out. Um, again, that barrel chest will happen. You will often see an anorexia, fatigue, and weight loss common in these patients because if they're always short of breath, it can be really hard to eat. They're using a ton of energy now just to breathe, and so they're just not hungry and have a hard time eating. We encourage these patients to snack and graze as much as they can throughout the day, have small finger foods available. Um, these patients also might develop a clubbed finger. They might have a bulbous like fingertip, which happens when you have chronic hypoxia. Um, your fingertips might be blunt and wide due to that decreased oxygen flow. You're going to commonly see this in smoking patients who have smoked for years and years. Take a look at your family members who are 30-year smokers and look at their fingertips and see if they have that clubbed looking to them. You don't have to tell them about it, but just peek at them and see if you notice that clubbing of the fingers. Or you could tell them about it and let them know about emphysema now that you know about it, right? The nickname for an emphysema patient is called a pink puffer. No, you do not say that to your patient directly. You do not tell them they're a pink puffer. It's just an acronym for you to remember the difference between emphysema and what we're going to get to in just a minute here with the chronic um, bronchitis. These patients have increased carbon dioxide retention, so they tend to either be a little bit of a normal color or they happen to have a little bit of shade of pink. They don't tend to be cyanotic or blue because they take a breath with their oxygenation um, gets too, too low. So you can review this list here again of the pink puffer. Keep that in mind, pink puffer with emphysema um, and remember what those how they present. Your treatment for emphysema is always going to include smoking cessation. It can be really hard to get patients, e even with chronic disease, to quit smoking. If we can catch it early, uh, we can work on smoking cessation. When I have my patients who are very far down the road of COPD, some of them know that this is a disease they're not going to outlive. And so some of them are like, hey, I'm not going to stop smoking because it's just I'm not. And so catching the smoking cessation early can be helpful. Cigarette smoking will make the disease rapidly progress. Uh, we also need to make sure that these patients are immunized against influenza and pneumonia because they're not able to fight off these infections as readily. So getting them immunized. We want to teach them appropriate breathing techniques, such as how to use that pursed lip breathing technique. Sometimes it becomes natural, but we also want to show them how to use it, especially when they're getting short of breath. We should encourage adequate nutrition and hydration, which can help improve energy levels and help fight infections. And then we can use respiratory pharmacology, which will include your bronchodilators, antibiotics when they're sick, oxygen therapy as they need. Um, and we're going to review medications in just a moment here. Switching gears now to the other component of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, remember it consists of emphysema and chronic bronchitis. So chronic bronchitis is a little different than emphysema. It's characterized by inflammation, obstruction, chronic cough, repeated infections two to three, uh, every twice every three months or longer over two years. Healthy people can have acute bronchitis. I'm sure some of you have had it or know someone who's had um, but when you have the risk factors such as smoking, you get recurrent infections that's classified as chronic bronchitis, which is very progressive. You will see the mucosa that's inflamed and swollen. You will see hypertrophy and hyperplasia of mucus glands. You'll see fibrosis, which is that thickening of that bronchial wall. Remember pneumonia, fibrosis is thickening of the alveoli, but with bronchitis, it's thickening of that bronchial wall. You'll see low oxygen levels, severe dyspnea, and you will often see fatigue. Signs and symptoms of chronic bronchitis include a constant productive cough, tachypnea, so fast breathing, and shortness of breath. The cough is prevalent because that thick mucus, they're trying to kill it. They're just constantly trying to cough, cough that stuff up and out. They'll get orthopnea, which is dif difficulty breathing when lying flat, because if you have a bunch of extra secretion in your lungs, it tends to pool. And if you lay flat, it tends to pool over the whole side of their lungs, which makes it difficult to breathe. They get frequent thick and purulent secretions. Um, the coughing and the ronchae is more severe in the morning. They can get hypoxia, cyanosis, hypercapnipnia. This is all caused by the airway obstruction. 
They can again have weight loss. They can have signs of core pulmonal, which is that right-sided heart failure, which again, we're going to learn about, and they can have peripheral edema. Whereas emphysema was noted, known as the pink puffer, or the, um, why did I just forget it? Pink puffer. Yeah, I got it. The chronic and bronchitis is known as the blue bloater. So you either have your pink puffer or your blue bloater. I've used this my whole life. I don't know why I lost pink puffer there for a minute. So Remember, emphysema is the pink puffer, chronic bronchitis is the blue bloater. Um, these patients have low oxygen levels, which make them blue in color. These patients tend to be hypoxic and will need oxygen much earlier. You can review the photo here of the symptoms. Um, and again, when you now have gone through these couple slides of emphysema and chronic bronchitis, go back to that side by side and kind of view how they're different and where they affect the part of lungs and how they present. I bet you are aware of what the uh, chronic bronchitis treatment plan is, of course, number one. This isn't an anti-smoking advertisement, but it really should be because this is really, I mean, this is what it is. This is what it caused. Again, it's important to immunize. The list is going to be very common to emphysema. Um, treatment, infections, adequate nutrition, uh, bronchodilators, antibiotics. The only difference here in the medications might be expectorants, like a mucinex, which is different from the emphysema. Uh, because you need them to cough that mucus up and out. Um, but again, the treatment will be pretty similar, except knowing that um, you'll watch when you give your oxygen administration. So now that we've touched a little bit on pharmacology, let's move on to it and dive just in a little bit. The medication, again, for cystic fibrosis is a little more complicated, really specific to the patient. We're not going to spend a lot of time reviewing those medications. They're very chronically ill with a high level of care. Uh, but we'll talk about the medications that are very familiar in the treatment of asthma and COPD. The common route of respiratory medications is inhalation because we can target the respiratory tissues directly. They usually work rapidly. They're pretty efficient. When inhaling our medication, rich blood supply allows for quick absorption and quick onset of action. It delivers the drugs directly to the site where it's needed in the lungs. When we have inflammation in our lungs, we can use inhaled medications, so inhalers that have steroids in them or anti-inflammatories in them to directly treat the inflammation in the lung versus giving them an oral anti-inflammatory that treats inflammation in the whole body. Since the whole body doesn't have inflammation, we might as well inhale the steroid and get the inflammation medication directly where it needs to go. We're going to talk about four different classes of respiratory medications, uh, SABAs, LABAs, ISCs, and LAMAs. That just sounds really funny, right? When you abbreviate them, they're the most common classes of inhaled medications. I'm going to give you some examples of each of them, but knowing the classifications is the most important. They're often given in combination with each other, which then often gets tricky and confusing as you start going through it all. Respiratory patients aren't just usually given one, they're actually given more, not for purposes of patho, but if you ever go on to advanced practice um, and are prescribing medications, the um, American Asthma um, Academy um, has a kind of a tiered approach to asthma and they all start with certain medications and then it just goes up from there. So mo most of your respiratory patients are gonna be on more than one of these types. Well, and I'll go over the abbreviations once we get to the slides here. So quickly, the treatment goals for asthma involves trying to reduce the episodes of bronchoconstriction and inflammation, as well as to decrease the number of episodes that happen. So you're wanting those asthma attacks to be controlled quickly and you're wanting them to be fewer and far between. We give these short acting medications because they work quickly when they have acute bronchospasm. So when you have your asthma attack, you give them a short acting, works quick, helps them turn that bronchospasm around. They usually get pretty quick relief for that medication, but we also give long acting medications to reduce how often asthma attacks happen. So if they're having regular asthma attacks every single day, you're gonna probably give them a long acting um, one as well. COPD is much more um, long and chronic treatment, and the goals are to relieve the symptoms, frequency of exacerbations, and avoid complications. Remember, the COPD now is to the point where we have uh, progressive damage, so our goals are really going to be to relieve the symptoms as we can. Okay, so your beta adrenergics agonists. These are the most effective drugs for relieving acute bronchospasms. 
We talk about beta agonists or beta blockers before that treat blood pressure. Now we're going to look at beta adrenergic agonists that work on beta 2 receptors. Remember beta 1, one heart, beta 2, two lungs. The beta 2 receptors work in bronchial smooth muscles to cause bronchodilation. This is where I tell them again, you're going to have that drinking straw. You take a bronchodilator inhaler, boom, it opens up to a uh, other way around, right? You have that juice box straw, you take a bronchodilator, opens up to a regular straw, you can breathe a little better. We do like to choose medications that only work on beta-2 receptors. So these are selective medications versus ones that work on beta-1 and beta-2 because the selective medications target that specific beta-2 receptor in the lungs. It'll have fewer cardiac side effects than the non-selective beta agonists. You can still experience tachycardia as a side effect because while they work primarily on beta-2, they might still slightly impact beta-1, which might increase our heart rate to caution. Um, this is really important to caution um, Use with caution in patients with hypertension and cardiac disease because you don't want to be triggering those um, um, receptors as well. It's really important when you're educating your patients that you're giving them a uh, beta agonist that's going to make bronchodilate that they might have heart heart rate. That's the one thing I tell those kids. You're going to take a little bit of that albuterol and you might have a little bit faster heart rate for a short period of time, but you're going to be able to breathe just a little bit better. So those abbreviations that we look to, the SABA or the LABA, they're called short-acting beta agonists or long-acting beta agonists. Short or long is directly related to how long they help with the bronchodilation. These are just examples. Again, you're not going to be treated, you're not going to be questioned on specific medications, but you notice that the T-E-R-O-L um, are the common suffixes with the SABAs and the LABAs. Um, albuterol is the most common SABA that we give. Um, and then you can see the other ones for the LABAs. The, the, basically, you need to know that they're bronchodilators and they either work on the short area or they work on the long area. And patients could be on one or both of these. Um, just real quick, the SABAs before we move on, um, the short acting beta agonists, um, you might also hear them as their rescue inhaler. Uh, rescue sounds like it's the point where they're already like in respiratory failure. And so I don't want you to confuse that, but um, the, the reason they're called the rescue inhaler is they have that asthma attack, they have that fast breathing and they work pretty quickly to get that air in and that, and that um, bronchodilation to happen. So they kind of rescue them from that respiratory situation they're having, but they could be, um, they can actually take them prophylactically too. So some asthmatics will take their puffer um, the, the short acting beta agonist puffer before, like that kid with basketball, I'm going to tell him, just take two puffs before you even go to basketball. So you start with open lungs. All right, moving on. Corticosteroids are the most potent natural anti-inflammatory drug. They work to reduce inflammation. They work by suppressing airway inflammation and reducing airway hyper-responsiveness. It gets the airway to kind of calm down, stop being inflamed, stop overreacting. When we talk about asthma being hyper-responsive disease, corticosteroids re reduce the ability of the airway to be as hyper-responsive and it reduces that inflammation. Inhaled corticosteroid preparations are the drug of choice for long-term prophylaxis of asthma and COPD. You can take them orally too, but again, let's get right to where we need it to be. We need it in the lungs, let's inhale them. The most common drugs in this class are fluticasone or Flovent or Bucinamide or Palmonocort. Um, these are drugs that are taken daily. And so you're, um, when you move up on that stepwise approach to treating asthma or COPD, you might add in an inhaled cortical steroid to help them have less frequent asthma attacks. Uh, system side effects are rare, systemic side effects are rarely observed. Uh, oral systemic steroids are used for short-term therapy. Um, other, you want to limit them. Um, oral systemic cannot be used for very long. Those, so when you put a person on prednisone, which we're going to learn about later, it's only five to 10 days because they affect not only airway, but the rest of our body. Uh, different with the air, the oral corticosteroids, it's going right to the lungs where we need it. So they can take these every day. Sometimes you do want to, they phase in and out of them. That's not important to remember, but just knowing that they can um, take these daily. When we're at administering corticosteroids, we want to keep in mind that they can reduce immune function and corticosteroids can disrupt the balance of microorganisms in the mouth. One side effect that can occur with oral cortical steroids is thrush, where we have that white patchy icky area in the mouth. Patients need to watch for signs and symptoms of simple infections. It's really important to tell them to rinse their mouth after steroid inhalers. I have an asthmatic that's lived in my house since he was in kindergarten, 
and rinse and spit was always the deal. And and he had a pulmonary pediatric pulmonologist who said the same thing. You have to, he trained him, rinse and spit, take your inhaler, rinse, spit, don't swallow that water, get rid of that extra steroid that's hanging out in your, in your mouth. The uh, patients also need to watch their blood glucose levels because corticosteroids can increase their blood sugar. So it's a little tricky to manage uh, a diabetic with these medications, but just knowing that's the case, you can adjust their other medications. Again, the primary purpose of inhaled corticosteroids is to prevent respiratory distress. Um, these are not used during a, an acute asthma attack. So that patient walks in and they're having that asthma attack right in front of you. They need those immediate bronchodilators. Um, the corticosteroids I use more in a patient who's having an asthma attack like every day or four days a week. You're doing this to increase how or decrease how often they have those asthma type attacks. The last class of medications to talk about is anticholinergic medications. There, that word is again, we've talked about anticholinergic before. Um, and in this case, they're long acting muscarinic antagonists. Those are your llamas. Llama medications work by blocking the bronchoconstriction effect of acetylcholine. So this pre prevents the neurotransmitter from causing the muscles surrounding the lungs to constrict, which reduces the symptoms of COPD. They improve lung function and can reduce exacerbation, exacerbation and improve asthma control. Think about it, they're almost the opposite. Um, they're not a bronchodilator, but they block the constriction from even happening. Some medications in this class um, block, also block the release of mucus into the airway lumen, which is super beneficial for COPD. And which one? Which one would it be more beneficial? I'm going to let you answer that. Emphysema or chronic bronchitis? Which one has more mucus? Uh, if you said chronic bronchitis, you're going to be right. So that one would be super helpful. Common ones are impetropria. I can't say the big long word. Atrovent and Spireva um, are the most common medications in this class. And just like that, we are to the end of the pulmonary system. Obviously, it's very complex in terms of the gas exchange part. Uh, but when you break it down and really kind of focus on the different parts of COPD and really focus on uh, the anatomy of asthma and how you're using those medications, I think it comes together. As usual, please let me know if you have any questions or concerns. I'll be happy to go over anything with you in greater detail. Thank you again, and I hope things are going well for you in your studies.